No, no, just kidding. <laughs> okay, well, um, let me um, pull up a case to share with all of you here. Um, today we're talking about inpatient management of acute decompensated heart failure, but um, I also think that particularly for uh, those joining us who see a lot of patients in the office, I think the first step is actually deciding when somebody needs inpatient management. Um, so I'm gonna present a case of someone who's coming into clinic and then we can discuss. So this is a 55 year old woman. She's coming to, to you complaining of worsened dyspnea. So you've known her for a while and usually she gets short of breath when she takes up the stairs in her home. She has to kind of stop halfway up. But now she started to feel short of breath just walking from the bedroom to the kitchen. I didn't put on here, but you know that she has systolic heart failure with an EF of about 40 to 45%. And now she's actually short of breath at rest and in clinic in front of you, looks like she's having a hard time breathing. So you get some vital signs. She's a bit tachycardic, 110. Her blood pressure is 147 over 95, and she's actually saturating 90% um, even after you get some oxygen on her in the clinic. Um, so just to throw it back out to the group, I know I laid this one on pretty thick, uh, but would, uh, any comments about whether you send her to the uh, ER, uh, urgent care, try to manage her as an outpatient, what are your thoughts? All right, this is, remember this is coming from the orthopedic PA. Oh, right, ortho. <laughs> I want cardiac enzymes immediately. <laughs> okay, so you're worried about ischemia for her. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so um, I think that, yeah, she definitely sounds like something new has happened. And your question is, um, as I think you really appropriately bring up, is there a new event that caused her to decompensate into heart failure like an MI, which can absolutely be the case? Or is this just a worsening of her underlying systolic heart failure? Um, and so investigating that is important. And in what setting would you want to investigate that? Are you keeping her in the ortho clinic um, to do some enzymes? <laughs> no, I'm only getting enzymes if I'm in the ER, but I'm, if I'm in the ortho clinic, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm calling 911. Yeah, and I think that's appropriate. You know, every clinic has their own method of dealing with patients who are acutely ill and whether you're connected to a hospital or not. But this woman is very hypoxic. Um, and so I think calling 911, getting her into an ambulance where they can be monitoring her on the way to the ER is very appropriate. So this lady, I laid it on pretty thick that she needed to come into the hospital. Um, but let's change her up a little bit. And let's say that she's not short of breath at rest. So she's just coming into clinic and saying to you, I'm feeling worse in shortness of breath when I walk from my bedroom to the kitchen. And that's not the same as what it was two weeks ago. Uh, what are some of the questions you might have for her or thoughts at that point when, you, when you're still gathering information? Anybody want to take a stab there? So I think... This is a real challenge, and especially those of you uh, who are um, in places where the hospital isn't right just down the road, this can be a, a big issue of whether to send somebody in or not. I was just going to jump in and say, yeah, his, from more history, has she been compliant with her cardiac medications? Has she had any recent weight gain? Um, has her diet changed or been off in any way that she could have increased her sodium intake? some of those historical stuff. Yeah, great. So you ask her all those things and she admits that um, to celebrate the fact that we can now uh, gather in small groups of people. They had a pizza party two days ago and uh, she did indulge in a couple of slices of pizza. Um, she's been taking her diuretics though, but she feels like they're not working very well and like her urine output just hasn't been quite that great. Um, and she hasn't run out of any other medications. So that's the main thing she tells you that's different. I wasn't sure if you had mentioned anything initially of her history, if she has any underlying kidney issues, what her um, view and creatinine are, if she has any chronic renal failure. Did yeah, great, great changes. I did not say that, no. <laughs> yeah, so her baseline creatinine is around 1.4, um, and that's kind of where she's been hover hovering, and she's 55, so her GFR is definitely greater than um, 30. She's kind of in that upper 50 to 60 range. And I didn't write it on here, but she has an EF of around 40% that you've known and it's been that way for about two years. 
So I think the question in that case, okay, so she, she took some, she ate some pizza, she's more short of breath. And so your challenge as a practitioner is to decide, can you manage this new decompensation as an outpatient or do you manage her as an inpatient? And I'm curious some of the approaches that you all take, and it, it might depend on other factors, but how do you guys approach that in your practice? You having any active chest pain or anginal equivalence, Dr. Toff? Yeah, great question. Um, so no, she just feels short of breath when she walks from the bedroom to the kitchen. It's the same shortness of breath that she gets on the stairs. It's just more pronounced now at less uh, amount of exercise, but no chest pain, no pressure. And I'll give you another piece of her history that you may want to know. Um, she's a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So she had a cath when she was first diagnosed two years ago, and she did not have significant coronary disease at that time. Uh, Dr. Top, question here from Dr. Deeds about what meds she's on. Yeah, so um, at home she is on, um, she's not been transitioned to an ARNI because she normally has blood pressure that's in the 110 range. So she's on lisinopril, 30 milligrams a day. She's on carvedilol, 12.5 milligrams twice a day. And her Lasix is 20 milligrams twice a day. She's pretty good about taking it twice a day. Every once in a while she forgets and only does once a day. And then Dr. Bayoun, I see you're asking, does she have a new murmur? Um, she does not. What are you thinking there about um, with a new murmur? You can type or say. Uh, with a dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, her valves could, uh, could leak and that could uh, um, also contribute to um, CHF symptoms or shortness. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Mitral regurgitation can be a, definitely a confounding factor in a lot of these people. Um, so you're kind of curious about that. And we pulled up her most recent echo, which she actually had kind of a standard echo um, about a month ago. And she didn't, she only had a mild to moderate MR at that time. Okay. And then uh, Jenny Griffo is saying she's not seen it, but has heard that some cardiology clinics can administer IV diuretics in stable fluid overload. Um, and then Dr. Dees is also suggesting about labs baseline and now. So you don't have any labs today in clinic. Your most recent labs were also at that one month ago visit. And her creatinine was 1.4. Her sodium was 135 at that time. Um, everything else looks pretty standard. She has a little bit of anemia that's chronic for her that was also stable with a, a hemoglobin of around 12.5. I think it's probably, I mean, the, the picture I'm getting is she's probably appropriate for some aggressive outpatient management with some close follow-up. Go ahead and bump up her Lasix, uh, appropriate potassium supplementation, get labs, you know, two to three days after starting that and see her back at that point and see how she's doing with some good return precautions. Yeah, I think that's absolutely great. And, and um, for me, the challenge here is always how much can I get her to do and comply with and what is our office capable of? So Dr. Worker, for you all, um, how soon could you bring her back and kind of what's your setup to manage people closely like this? Yeah, so I am, I'm attached to or part of South Lyon Medical Center, which is the, there's a small ER and acute hospital in Urington, which is about 20 miles away from me, um, where we have a lab. So I could probably get her, most of my patients are coming from Urington anyway, so get her to do the labs there um, and then see her back in clinic in a, in a day or two or three. Yeah, that's great. I, I think this is where the challenge really lies in managing decompensated heart failure. I think everyone's convinced and asked appropriate questions to be convinced that this is just an exacerbation of her underlying condition. There's not something new going on. If you had any red flag features like chest pain, um, uh, or she was, you know, really it was significantly different in a very short amount of time, you might send her straight into the ER to manage. Um, but if you're convinced this is just she had some extra pizza, her diuretics aren't quite working well enough, let's try to bump them up and see what happens. Exactly the challenges that you mentioned. She needs close follow-up. So she needs to be seen within a couple of days, a week at the most, to see if your diuretics worked. She um, needs to have labs checked because you wanna see what happens to her potassium and magnesium as you increase her diuretics. And then honestly, I find it such a challenge 
to give people high doses of diuretics if they have to go out and do anything, right? You've all heard this before. Like I take my diuretics, but not if I have to go out and go shopping or do errands because I don't wanna be running to the bathroom all day long. Now, right now, everybody's stuck at home, although that's starting to change. So it might be a little bit easier, um, but getting someone to really comply with a higher dose of Lasix and to actively diurese is a challenge. Um, so I always instruct them to, for daily weights. And then if your clinic has the ability with a medical assistant um, or with someone else who manages acute patients like this to get phone calls from this person daily to see what her weight is doing and adjust as appropriate, I find weight is the best outpatient measurement of her volume status. Um, so let's say we do all of those things. She's willing to drive and get her labs. Awesome. She actually does it. Awesome. <laughs> so your potassium supplementation was appropriate. Her potassium comes back. It's about 3.7. Um, she's lost about two and a half pounds after four days on your increased diuretic regimen. And she is feeling slightly better, although not back to baseline. Thoughts about what you do for her at that point in time? Do you, uh, your options would be to continue her higher dose diuretics, put her back onto her standard regimen. What would your thoughts be? I think potentially con continuing her on the higher dose for a few more days is appropriate. Although, yeah, start to, to wonder about did, did she maybe have a event and, and repeating some of that cardiac stuff like an echo and um, getting some updated studies that way. Yeah, and you know, um, we always bring this into effect, but usually insurance will pay for a repeat echo, even though it was only a month ago, if she's had a change in status. So you could now say she has dyspnea at rest as your indication for the echo and get another one to see. And, you know, as you follow patients, you get a sense of this is something she does every time she has a salty meal, she has an exacerbation, we give her seven to 10 days of increased diuretics and she gets back to baseline. Or... This is someone who's been rock solid stable for two years. Nothing has changed even with dietary changes. And now suddenly something's different. You might treat those two people a bit differently. Um, Dr. Dees is saying, consider spironolactone. Yeah, so I think now is also a great time to consider, can I escalate any of her therapies? Um, and in particular, the two that you'd wanna see is, can I get her onto an ARNI instead of onto the ACE inhibitor? So can I get her onto Entresto? And then also spironolactone both of which you have to worry about renal function and potassium. So it's a little challenging when you're actively diuresing, although both of them are gonna raise the potassium. So that might help you. But they also both have the um, uh, chance of raising the creatinine. So I think my approach would be get her euvolemic and then try to get her onto some of those other therapies, use it as an opportunity. Okay, great. So that's kind of someone just to, to give us an example to talk through about how we think through the outpatient uh, management. Um, uh, now let's go back to the initial case that I gave you where she clearly needed to come into the hospital. Um, so uh, she would go to the ER, she's given 20 milligrams of IV Lasix just one time in the ER, admitted to the hospitalist service, and, and I want to tell you kind of a typical course of what I often see for these patients. So um, day one, her creatinine is 1.4, heart rate's 110, it is sinus. I was thinking about making this case more challenging with putting her into AFib because that always happens but I thought let's not for now. <laughs> so we'll leave her in sinus, but some tachycardia. Um, and then uh, she's put on Lasix 20 IV BID. Oh, there's her blood pressure, 140 over 87, which is a bit higher than what she normally runs. And then as you all know, if you've done any work in the hospital, eyes and nose are impossible. So you have no idea how much she actually diuresed. You just know what you gave her. So the next day, creatinine is 1.5, heart rate's 114, blood pressure 138 over 85. Again, Lay620 IV BID, still on four liters nasal cannula. So uh, kind of continuing the course, still getting active diuresis. Day three, creatinine hanging in there, 1.5, heart rate 110, blood pressure a little lower, 135 over 70. And now the thought was, you know, she really didn't make much progress after 48 hours of diuresis, so let's slam her. So Lay680 IV TID plus metolazone five milligrams are given. So now, because we because we got to get this woman out of the hospital, right? She's been here for more than 48 hours. It's time to rock and roll. Day four, creatinine now has jumped to two. Her heart rate, though, has come down to 100. Blood pressure, 130 over 80. Diuretics are stopped and cardiology is consulted because at this point, it seems like our standard diuresis is not really working. So 
any thoughts or ideas about her management, things you would do differently, things that you liked, what happened for her? Does this seem like a typical, uh, what you've seen in the hospital? It is for me. Maybe I missed, but was she clinically volume overloaded? I didn't tell you. Good question. Yeah. So, well, she was on four liters of nasal cannula, which was new for her. On exam, she had crackles that were halfway up the lung field. Her chest x-ray showed uh, some pulmonary edema and her JVP, she has a little bit of a thick neck habitus, uh, but her JVP does appear to be elevated. And lower extremity, she has about one plus edema on exam. Okay, so Dr. Dees is suggesting that in, as an inpatient, I believe to repeat her echo at this point to get a BNP. Yeah, so you know, a lot of people get that BNP um, when they come in and some people even try to use it to guide diuresis. The studies have not been that successful at a particularly inpatient use of BNP to guide diuresis. Some people love it and they use it. Personally, I don't use it all that much. I usually use BNP for confirming a, a suspected diagnosis of heart failure. Um, and people have tried because it seems like we should just be able to diurese her to a better BNP and that should make sense. Unfortunately, the studies haven't really borne out so much. But yes, I think that because she got uh, hospitalized, at some point during admission, you're going to want an echo. Um, I love to get the echo once they're euvolemic if I can, because if they have volume overload, sometimes that's going to, for, for example, make MR look worse than what it really is. But if you have reached a limit with your diuresis and you just just can't get there, then I think it's very reasonable to get an echo to define what the problem is. Any other thoughts about her uh, diuresis? And uh, maybe we can follow, um, Dr. Bayoun, your thoughts about her volume status, because you asked me, was she volume overloaded? What were you thinking there? Oftentimes, uh, when the person is actually truly volume overloaded uh, with diuresis, uh, if she actually responds to diuresis, I would also expect the cranium to actually come down. Excellent. Yeah, so I think that is a wonderful point that I try to uh, really drive home into the medical students and residents. Um, uh, we're all probably familiar or have heard about cardiorenal syndrome, where people get elevated creatinine in the setting of volume overload. And when I was a resident, we used to all say, oh, it's from poor cardiac output and poor forward flow. And it turns out that's not actually why people get cardiorenal syndrome. The reason the creatinine goes up in deep compensated heart failure is actually related to the CVP. If you do right heart casts on all these people and you measure invasively all their chemodynamics, the measurement that correlates most closely with renal function is CVP. So the problem is that your renal venous pressure has gone up because of your venous volume overload. And so then the perfusion pressure or the difference between your renal arterial pressure and your renal venous pressure is narrowed. It's not because the renal arterial pressure is down, it's because the renal venous pressure is up. And so as you diurese them, you actually get better perfusion of the kidneys and the creatinine often will come down. So yes, I totally agree. And I usually don't stop the diuresis for a jump in renal function unless it's very profound and very intense. Some people will say, well, the creatinine isn't getting better with my diuresis, but that's just a sign, I agree with you, Dr. Bayoun, that they probably are still volume overloaded. And if you persist and press forward, oftentimes that creatinine will come down. Great, other thoughts? Just in our initial discussion, um, you know, we were concerned about an acute event. So wondering if during the ER course or early uh, hospitalization, she was worked up for more acute stuff, troponins, EKG changes, the lot. Yeah. Great, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So she got troponin. Not surprisingly, they were elevated, but they were elevated and flat. So she had a troponin of 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.79. Those were her three troponins. Um, and this brings up a very important point that when you're volume overloaded, your left ventricular end diastolic pressure, the pressure inside the ventricle, it goes up with the volume. That actually decreases the perfusion pressure for the coronary arteries. And so therefore you can get what we call subendocardial ischemia or ischemia of that very fragile distal muscle that's fed only by the small blood vessels. And so it's very common to actually have chest pain and elevated troponins in the setting of decompensant or heart failure. I get consulted for that all the time. And I love it because it's just, uh, it, it's easy for me once you guys have already sweated it out, getting three troponins and wondering what's going on. And I see that they're nice and flat. That suggests subendocardial ischemia. If they rise and fall, I'm much more concerned about an acute MI. 
And then we correlated it with her EKG. And in that instance, she had some nonspecific T wave inversions, but no ST changes on serial EKGs. Um, and so did not fit the pattern of an acute ischemic event. But yes, very important to work that up um, and not the case that appeared in her case. And your, the repeat echo that someone had mentioned is also part of that, because if suddenly she goes from global hypokinesis EF of 40%, and now she's got an EF of 20% with an inferior wall motion abnormality, that's kind of making us suspect maybe there was an acute event because something changed. Okay, good. Other thoughts about uh, kind of how she got to this point or what you would do for her going forward? Because her creatinine bumped, you slammed her with diuretics, and she's still clinically volume overloaded. So what do you do now? Call for help. <laughs> yeah, so here's a few of my thoughts on this case. Um, I think that this is just a very common case of what happens in the hospital. Um, and this is not to uh, disparage any of our colleagues, but getting accurate I's and O's if they don't have a Foley catheter is really almost impossible. So I look at the I's and O's that are recorded, but really I use weight. Getting a daily standing weight is also almost impossible in the hospital, but I like weight better. And then really it's my clinical exam. So I really appreciate the discussion of clinically what's happening with her. I think a lot of times people use their oxygen level as the surrogate endpoint for euvolemia. But remember that you can be volume overloaded and have totally normal um, oxygen saturations because not all of the time do people put their volume in their lungs. People hide it in different places, belly, legs, back of the thighs. And so really JVP is gonna be my main thing that I'm looking at. That is challenging. I literally spent you know, four years of my life learning how to look at a JVP. <laughs> and not every patient can we visualize it. But uh, clinically, I think that's really important to try and diurese them all the way to eubulimia. My thoughts for this woman is that probably that initial dose of 20 IV BID was just too low for her. Um, I probably would have started a little more aggressive. The rule of thumb is usually you take their oral dose and then you give that IV because that should be two times as potent. I often will double their oral dose and give that twice a day. So if she was on 20 milligrams BID at home of Lasix, I would probably give her 40 IV BID in the hospital. Um, what we saw in her case when her creatinine jumped all of a sudden, that was probably just because we went too fast on that one day. We got tired of waiting, seemed like she wasn't getting diuresed, and so we slammed her. We like quadrupled her diuretic dose, plus we gave her metolazone on the same time. And if you looked at her eyes, and you know, she was probably peeing all day and all night long. Um, in that case, you have to remember that our, our body, our volume of distribution, right? We have intracellular and extracellular fluid. We also have intravascular and extravascular fluid. You can be volume overloaded uh, extravascularly, but you need time to get that fluid from the extravascular space into the intravascular space. Our circulating blood volume is really only around five to seven liters. So you can't diurese somebody really you can't really diurese somebody more than five liters without compromising that because you need time to recruit into the intravascular space. So I think what happens a lot of time is once we see the creatinine rise, we back off the diuretics, we say, well, that's probably as good as we can do and send you home if you're not on oxygen or even if you are on oxygen. But the approach that I like to take is give them a diuretic holiday to give time for that fluid to move from the extravascular space to the intravascular space. TED stockings, compress them venously and make them walk around because that will all recruit everything. Um, and then the next day, usually the creatinine has come down a little bit and then I try again, but a bit more gently. Um, and then the other thought I have about her, and I see this happen a lot, we'll talk about it in the didactic, um, she never received any afterload reduction. And you know, her blood pressure wasn't terrible, 130s, 140s. But if we understand the physiology of heart failure and we remember that the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is activated in heart failure, so she actually has vasoconstricting peptides floating around, that's making it harder for the heart to pump and therefore to deliver fluid to the kidneys and therefore to diurese. So afterload reduction is a really important part of not only our chronic management, but also our inpatient management. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's a really important thing to do when we're diuresing people. 
Um, other thoughts, questions, or comments about this case before we kind of move into some more didactic? Just a quick question, Dr. Toff. You know, she was persistently tachycardic and already on a, a medium dose of, of Coreg. Would you adjust that at all, try and maybe slow her down a little bit and get more function out of those beats, or would you not adjust that in the, this setting? Yeah, absolutely great question. I will go through in detail how I approach beta blockers um, in general, but let's talk about it specifically with her because I think it's important. Um, sinus tachycardia in the setting of decompensated heart failure. I go back to remembering that physiology equation, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So when the heart rate is up in sinus, to me that suggests that I'm compensating for a low stroke volume. So I see that 110 more as a marker that she's sick as opposed to something to treat. Um, in her case, 12.5 of Coreg is, you know, it's right, like you said, it's a moderate dose. I probably would start her on 6.25 the first day to see how she tolerates, because if I actually beta block her too much, I might decrease her cardiac output, just as I'm trying to actually increase her stroke volume. Um, but the other, the only instance in which I would take exception to that was if she had severe MR, as one of the other colleagues mentioned. Um, sometimes, uh, with mitral valve disease, we like for them to be a little bit um, slower, but that's mostly for mitral stenosis, um, which is gonna be a pretty rare combination to have a low EF and a mitral stenosis. Um, so with, uh, I, sorry, I misspoke when I said MR, I meant mitral stenosis. If, in that case, I definitely beta block sinus tech, but otherwise I see it more as a marker of how ill she is. And my hope is that as a diurese her and give her after lobe reduction, that heart rate's gonna come down into the 90s. So very good, very relevant question. Okay, and there were some on the chat. I apologize, sometimes it's hard for me to get the chat up here. Let's go, okay, got it. Uh, yeah, so it's from Dr. Ban. He says, for okay. those who have length of stay metric yeah. on their necks, has anybody seen the faster volume distribution intravascularly with albumin? Yeah, great question, and you bring up a very important point. You know, you're getting hounded. Why is this woman still in the hospital? <laughs> Um, so the first thing is, I always do IV diuretics twice a day and twice a day lab checks. That will at least justify the hospital stay from a Medicare standpoint. Um, unfortunately, albumin, um, it's a back pocket trick that we reach in and try to use when we're in dire straits, like in the ICU ventilated with low albumin, um, somebody perhaps who has liver failure. But just using albumin routinely, we don't have good randomized control data to suggest that that's going to decrease their length of stay. You'll see people try it as a back pocket trick. Um, my, my recollection is that albumin is not that cheap to do. Um, so I tend not to do it. I just tend to be um, very aggressive on checking on my diuresis at least twice a day and uh, try not to let it go until the next morning because I can redose them this evening if my morning diuretic didn't work. It's a little more work that way, but that's how I tend to do it. Okay, great questions. Um, all right, so uh, Troy, let's actually transition, excuse me, to the didactic if we can, and I think you want your um, slides. I'll stop sharing mine. Yeah, so actually um, I'll ask Sneha to pull those up, but while she's doing that, there was a question that came in early in the session from uh, Amy. She's asking, I'm wondering if you could please address the recent article in NEJM on uh, varicigot in the treatment of heart failure and thoughts on it. Um, yeah, that's like a whole other topic. <laughs> so probably not today, but stay tuned uh, because we do have um, some sessions planned about some of our novel therapeutics with heart failure. And so we would include it there, but uh, sorry, it's a little too big to tackle in today's session, but really great question. All right, so I'll take care of uh, Sneha, if you wanna go to the first uh, couple slides there, the disclaimer and put it in presentation mode. Um, so this is just a reminder letting you know that we do record all of these sessions. If you don't want to be on video, let us know. Send us something through the chat box and we can actually edit you out. Uh, and then if you do present a patient case, please just don't disclose any uh, protected health information. Uh, some other housekeeping items here just our uh, disclosure policy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Toft. Okay, great. And um, we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about acute decompensated heart failure and um, approaching patients from the warm, cold, dry, wet. If you're familiar with that patient profile, um, we'll talk about that. 
Um, and then also a bit about how to transition people from the hospital back to the outpatient world and try to get them set up for success. Next slide, please. Just a reminder, we've talked about this in some of our last sessions, but systolic heart failure or reduced ejection fraction, which comes in two broad categories, ischemic or non-ischemic, we have a lot of evidence for how to treat these people. If you press next, Neha, it's animated. Um, so we really know what to do for these people. As opposed to non-systolic heart failure or HEF-PEF, uh, we don't have really any good pharmacologic uh, therapy evidence for them. That is changing. There's an ongoing study for the inpatient treatment of HEF-PEF with ARNI or Entresto. Um, but uh, that said, my tenets for how I treat these on the inpatient side are actually very similar. So I'm borrowing from what we know about systolic heart failure and applying some of those same principles from the physiology standpoint to our HEFPEF or non-systolic. Today's discussion is really focused on systolic heart failure, but you can pretty much um, do the same principles for non-systolic heart failure. Next slide, please. This is a chart that I uh, made up because it's how I organize things in my head if it's helpful for anyone else. We have so many different classes of medications for heart failure. And so when I'm thinking about them, I kind of categorize them into what's my goal. So some give us symptom reduction, some give us mortality benefit, some cause actually improvement of LV function, others are kind of second line therapy, and then a few inotropes in particular worsen mortality. So this is how I keep them organized to remind myself what is the function of this medication. Um, so I just reference it there in case that's helpful for anyone. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is how I approach my decompensator heart failure patients. Making the diagnosis and uh, being convinced that's what send them to the hospital, that's a whole other topic. But once we're convinced this is volume overload, from systolic or non-systolic heart failure. This is a very um, famous way to approach them, made famous by Lynn Warner Stevenson. And so we ask two questions. Number one, are they wet or are they dry? If they're in the hospital because of their heart failure, they really should be wet for the most part. And we're looking at all of those clinical signs we discussed, jugular venous distension, lower extremity edema, um, pulmonary edema, hypoxia, and then don't forget belly distension. Some people hide all of their fluid, it's just in their belly. So I always ask, do your shoes fit tighter and are your pants fitting tighter? Because that might be the only place where they store their fluid. Um, so that's the first thing. Are they wet or are they dry? And then we ask, are they warm or are they cold? This actually requires us putting our hands onto the patient. Uh, my favorite place to check for this is actually just the back of the calf right below the knee. If you actually just feel the knees, if you remember from med school, your joints are always slightly, well, and then we have an orthopedist here. Your joints are going to, should be slightly colder than the rest of your body, right? So if I feel a joint, that's not going to be very accurate. And then sometimes people are exposed to the cold before they come into the ER, or exposed to the heat, uh, and it's, it's a little bit hard to tell with distal calves. So I put back of the calf just below the knee is where I feel if they're warm or if they're cold. Um, the importance of this is you're actually thinking about their hemodynamics. This is a way of doing a right heart calf or floating an imaginary swan without ever doing anything invasive. With the wet versus dry question, we're really asking about volume. CVP or left atrial pressure, which is a surrogate for left ventricular end diastolic pressure. We're just trying to figure out, do they have extra volume in the system? The cold or warm question is twofold. There's two things that can cause somebody to be cold. One is low cardiac output. The other is high systemic vascular resistance. So low cardiac output, that probably makes sense. If you're not getting a lot of blood pumping, then you're actually going to be cold because of it. Systemic vascular resistance is the more common cause of being cold. So remember that in heart failure, we get this inappropriate activation of renin angiotensin system. So our blood vessels are clamped down. They think that there's low blood volume, even though there's not. And so they clamp down really tight. That's what we call maladaptive because I have a weak heart trying to pump against a very tight system now. And that can also cause you to be cold because again, lack of circulation. And those are important because I need to treat that part of it as well as the volume. If you press next, Neha, that will show us here. So we use these profiles to help us guide our treatment. If I have high volume, I use diuretics. 
if you press next again. Um, if I have high SVR, I need to give afterload reduction. If I have low cardiac output, I need to give inotropes. And so figuring those things out is very important. I'll just point your attention to profile um, C, cold and wet. Those people should be in an ICU. Those people really should not be managed on the floor because once you're really cold, this is very um, a difficult dance to do. <laughs> And then profile L, cold and dry, that's the worst of all because there's not much you can do. If they're cold and wet, at least I can diurese them and that might get them better place on the starling curve. And so therefore we are in a better shape. But cold and dry is really end stage heart failure. These are the people who are in the ICU at a, a tertiary center getting inotropes and getting worked up for VAD transplant or death. Um, so if they really are cold and dry, that's, uh, that's not the good one. I mean, I like taking care of them because I like the ICU, but <laughs> the majority of your inpatients are going to be profile B, warm and wet, and your outpatients are hopefully profile A, warm and dry. Okay, great. Next slide, please. So I'm going to focus on the warm and wet, but I think keep in mind that we want to be approaching patients and determining this and not assume that they're warm and wet. Next slide, please. Okay, so to start with diuretics, everybody knows I should diurese them. Here are my tricks of the trade uh, for, for doing this for a living. So loop diuretics, those are our staple. You should give it IV if they're in the hospital, at least BID. TID for Lasix or furosemide is absolutely fantastic. It lasts six hours, right? That's where the name comes from. So TID is fine there as long as the patient's okay with peeing all night long. Um, so these are inhibiting our sodium potassium two chloride transporters. So you decrease sodium resorption and sodium and water follows it. We don't have any trials proving mortality benefit, but we know that this works to relieve congestion. These are some of my personal tricks. I check the potassium and magnesium twice a day if I'm aggressively diuresing them. That means if my goal is negative two liters, I try to check them BID. People hate that because they're being stuck like a pin cushion. Um, but it's important, you know, once you've seen one person die from hypokalemia during diuresis, uh, you feel like an extra pin cushion stick is worthwhile. Um, and then the goal here is not the dose, the goal is the effect. And that's where it's very difficult to tell. But I usually aim for two liters a day, which is about two, ki two kilos. Um, about one liter is about one kilo. So weights are gonna be the most accurate. Getting a standing weight, that's again, very hard to do and accomplish in the hospital. Um, bed weights, I don't trust at all. But then I use my physical exam to determine whether I'm making any progress. And then as we discuss in the case, if you get a contraction alkalosis, so the bicarb goes up and the BUN goes up, that's because we're decreasing that intravascular volume. I just give them a diuretic holiday, half a day or a full day, and I start again the next day. I personally, I have the luxury because I'm not a hospitalist, I don't get as much pressure for length of stay, but I very much try to get them diuresed all the way to euvolemia. The reason is, as you outpatient doctors can attest, it's very hard to diarrhea someone as an outpatient. I mean, very hard. <laughs> I, I have very little success with doing that. Um, so I really try to get them as dry as I can because as much as length of stay is an important metric, remember that heart failure readmissions, we don't get paid anything for that entire stay. So our best way to prevent readmission is by diureting them all the way to euvolemia. Um, and then a lot of times people will ask about a drip of diuretics versus intermittent IV dosing. They've done this trial um, multiple times actually, and there is no difference in length of stay, renal function, or outcomes using a drip versus intermittent IV dosing. I will do the drip from time to time if I want to do a more gentle every hour, but there's no evidence that tells me that I have to do that or that it's the best way. So the answer for loop diuretics as to what's the, what's the best regimen is, whatever works, titrate to effect. And then here's just a little chart to remind us, I think everyone has their favorite diuretic that they're comfortable with using. Um, and when you go to different institutions, you might see different practice patterns. Um, what I like about bumetanide or Bumex is that it's orally bioavailable. So um, there's not a ton of difference between an IV and oral dose. This is nice when you're transitioning someone onto oral diuretics. But that said, if you have a lot of gut edema from right-sided volume overload, you aren't gonna get as potent effect. So in the inpatient side, I do IV pretty exclusively. Okay, um, next slide, please. 
So then just to remind us about, oh man, med school or, or PA school and where these things act. So we have our loop diuretics acting in the loop of Henle to basically decrease sodium resorption. We can augment that by adding in a thiazide diuretic seen at number four. So this is blocking our sodium chloride transporter and now we have even more sodium excretion. When you combine those two, you're dumping a lot of sodium into the nephron and that's very powerful. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So thiazides are something that we add on. I usually do this if my loop diuretic is reaching a high dose, I'm not getting as much bang for my buck. The classic teaching that I was taught is to give it 30 minutes before your loop diuretic to kind of prime the system. Um, it turns out that if you're giving them loop diuretics already, they probably already have more or less steady state, so you can kind of give it any time. But if you're being a purist, it's good to give it slightly before your dose of loop diuretic. I strongly, strongly, strongly prefer metolazone because of the cost, which I've put into here. So if you look at this chart, um, metolazone, it is oral, 2.5 to 5 milligrams. I usually start with 2.5, it's pretty potent. It costs about a dollar a dose. Diaryl, which other people love, um, which is IV, is $500 a dose. So I only do diaryl if there's some reason why I don't think they're gonna absorb the oral metolazone, even though um, I still get pretty potent effect even in people with lots of gut edema. So please, please, please use metolazone. It really is much more cost effective. The thing here though is that your electrolyte losses are augmented. So if I was careful with loop diuretics, once I've given them one of these, I am very aggressive with treating and replacing my electrolytes because you're really gonna start to see significant losses when you add in the thiazides. Um, Troy, you'll, you'll uh, catch me if there's any questions on the um, uh, chat, please, okay. And please feel free to jump in if anyone has a question. Next slide, please. So a word on JVD, I've kind of harked on that so far. So this is really how I measure my intravascular volume. I like to think about it as, uh, you know, the cardiovascular system when all the valves are open is one big circuit. So I'm looking at my JVP. My JVP is a surrogate for my central venous pressure, which is a surrogate for my right atrial pressure, which is a surrogate through the lungs for my pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a surrogate for my left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So I'm looking at the neck on the right side to try and figure out what's my left-sided filling pressure, okay? Um, so the best way to do this is to have the head of the bed at 30 degrees, chin up, and it needs to be tilted to the side because you want the sternocleidomastoid muscle to be relaxed. If they're tensing, if they go really to the side, you'll obscure it. And then what you're looking for is this double pulsation inward. So if I'm looking on this side, it's a double bounce, if you remember that venous pulsation. It's a double bounce inward, as opposed to a carotid, which is boom, 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 single pulsation outwards. I check myself. So carotid, I should not be able to occlude with normal finger pressure. So I feel, if I feel it's the carotid pulse, obviously that's not the jugular vein. But if I'm trying to see if it's jugular venous, I will actually put my fingers at the base of the neck and occlude. And if I get that pulsation to go away, then I know I'm looking at the JVP. I also usually press the liver first to try to get it to engorge. Then I get a sense of where it is. I take my hand off the liver, let it fall down, and that's gonna be where my jugular venous pressure really is lying. If you want to have a number, I don't find the number to be necessary except for when you're trying to sound smart. <laughs> then you measure from the sternomanubrial angle up to it and then add five centimeters. Um, I really just say it's mid neck, low neck, and I'm just looking for a change when I'm doing this personally and not trying to round and impress anybody. Okay. Um, to go back to metolazone, we have a question from Dr. Wartgo. Is there a rule of thumb for potassium replacement with metolazone dosing? I'm familiar with using half the Lasix dose as a milliequivalent dose with loop diuretics. Yeah, great question. There isn't really a rule of thumb. Usually you're gonna need about one and a half to two times the potassium that you needed with just the loop diuretics alone. My, so I basically try to get them to a K of four or above before I give the thiazide diuretic, and then I follow it, and then I can give them their replacement daily as needed, um, but not as easy to gauge beforehand. Great question. Okay, next slide, please. 
So this is just, you know, reminding us about where you're looking on the neck and then where you're measuring from that sternomanubrial angle. Um, I, I will say this is, this is a difficult skill. It's an important one, um, but especially depending upon body habitus and neck size, it can be really hard to find the JVD. Um, but it is worthwhile because they may not have any lower extremity edema at all. And this might be your only metric of their volume status. Next slide, please. Okay, and then as I kind of mentioned in the case, we don't want to forget afterload reduction. So I've said a couple times, heart failure causes this activation of your renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, so there's diminished renal blood flow that makes the kidneys think I need to constrict, like as in when I'm septic or when I've had blood loss. But this is maladaptive because this vasoconstriction is bad for a weak heart. In addition, it's causing increased sodium resorption in the kidneys, which is the exact opposite of what we want to do. Um, I th the important thing here is, even if they have a normal blood pressure, even if the blood pressure is 120 over 80, I still try to do afterload reduction because I know physiologically that this system is revved up. And oftentimes I will give them an ACE inhibitor, I'll give them hydralazine, the blood pressure won't budge at all. All I'm doing is relieving some of that vasoconstriction, making it easier for the heart to pump. So I'm just tipping the physiology of the system back into place. So I am targeting, I would love to have a blood pressure around 110 if I can for all of these decompensated systolic heart failure patients. But more importantly, I want the medicine on board. Um, next slide, please. So I'll talk about how I do that. This is just a slide reminding you about that mechanism of renin angiotensin aldosterone and all of these maladaptive things that happen. But the two main things are vasoconstriction and then increased salt re uh, resorption. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's how I approach that afterload reduction on the inpatient side. You can press next. I'm sorry that I animated all of these. I forgot I wouldn't be in control. Yeah, you can just go through the whole thing. And so, um, if you're not certain about can their blood pressure tolerate it or will their renal function tolerate it, the trick that I do is Captopril, which is kind of a med that not many people use, but in the inpatient setting, I love it. It's an eight hour medication. And if I get the dose wrong, I don't have to wait that long for the effect to wear off. So I started a low dose of Captopril, 6.25, three times a day. If they tolerate that first dose, at the next dose, I go up to 12.5, the next dose, 25, and the next dose, 50. 50 is the max, and 50 of Captopril TID is the same as 40 of Lisinopril. So I will do this for about 24 hours to get them on their max tolerated dose of ACE inhibitor, and then I just switch them over to Lisinopril. I do not use Enalapril. Other people do. That's fine. I just, just don't use it. So I really like Captopril if I have good renal function. Of course, the challenge here is that a lot of these people have fluctuating renal function. So that could be a challenge to get them onto these meds. So that's when I switch to using hydralazine, which is in the next slide. If they're already on something at home, I will continue that and I will up titrate to get their blood pressure lower. Um, the important thing is, again, I want the mechanism of action to alleviate the RAS revved up that we have. I try not to get rid of them completely. Sometimes you're forced to. Their blood pressure goes low, their creatinine doubles, sometimes you have to. But I make a very strong note to get them back onto it before they leave. And as you guys probably know, when they leave the hospital for systolic heart failure, if you don't document why they're not on ACE or ARB, you're gonna get dinged. Um, so this is really important to try to get them back onto it before they leave the hospital. For me, a creatinine of two is kind of where I start to hesitate and feel like I should probably hold it. Um, that's my personal feeling. My heart failure colleagues that do decompensated heart failure all day, every day, literally, they go up to three. <laughs> so there is something to be said about comfort level and what we're doing. And then I added on ARBs here. A lot of patients are already on them, which is fantastic. I continue them. These are not as easy to titrate as Captopril. So if I'm starting fresh, I start with Captopril because I love how easy it is to titrate. Next slide, please. Okay, so the other option is isosorbide and hydralazine, the combination. Um, in the long term, we know that there's mortality benefit in African-American patients who are optimized otherwise on beta blockers, but 
I use this as a substitute for ACE, ARB, or ARNI in the setting of fluctuating renal function. So in the hospital, that creatinine is bouncing all around. I'll sometimes just switch and put them on hydralazine. I also do put them on nitrates at the same time, but then I switch them back to an ACE or ARB at the time of discharge, unless they're African-American. So this is a lot of switching meds back and forth, but I'm really trying to drive home the point of how important afterload reduction is. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna kind of um, run through, and you can keep going until everything's filled in. I animated it very strangely, sorry about that. Um, aldosterone antagonists. So as you know, these are guideline-directed medical therapy for systolic heart failure, spironolactone being the old cheap one that a lot of people use. Um, this is, you add on, they've got beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, you add this on. I wanna go to the next slide to just basically say that I don't use these that much on the inpatient side, and here's why. When the RAILS trial came out, which was the one for spironolactone, this is the rate of admission for hyperkalemia, double, it just skyrocketed. And if you press next, I've also added on here, the um, deaths due to hyperkalemia also skyrocketed. So if you press next, my little rule of thumb is that I only prescribe spironolactone if they are reliable for a lab check once they leave the hospital. So depending on your patient population, sometimes I start the spiro at the first visit. So they've come to see me. So now I'll start the spironolactone. Other very um, reliable people who always keep their appointments, I'm fine with starting it, but I always get a potassium check before their next visit. The only exception is if they've had an acute MI, then I have to start the spironolactone in the hospital, but that's a separate talk. Okay, next, because I want to get to beta blockers before we finish. So this big question about beta blockers, there are a lot of effects. The ones I worry most about are the negative inotropic effects. Next slide, please. So, uh, and you can um, press until everything is here. Okay, so the only three that we use for systolic heart failure, metoprolol, succinate, sustained release, carvedilol, bisoprolol we tend to prefer carvedilol, but it has a more potent blood pressure effect. These are chronically helpful. So what's helpful in the long run could be, hurtful, could be harmful in the short term, okay? So you have to be very cautious when they're in the hospital. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you my uh, brain and how, uh, it'll be the next one. That's showing you chronic, 21 months is when you're seeing benefit, right? So you're not seeing a benefit if I start at day one versus day three of the hospital stay. Um, next slide, please. So this is animated too. You can just go through. So here's how I do it. Chronic stable heart failure as an outpatient, start low, double every two weeks until their blood pressure and heart rate are maxed. I want them on both beta blocker and ACE, ARB, or ARNI. So I'm trying to get them onto max doses of both of those things as blood pressure allows. But in the hospital, kind of three categories. If, if they are on chronic low-dose therapy, carvedilol 6.25, metoprolol XL 50 once a day, I just keep that going because their beta receptors are already saturated um, and they are used to having this medication. If they're on chronic high-dose therapy, so carvedilol 50 twice a day, metoprolol XL 100 a day, I usually cut it in half. And that's because I'm worried about the negative inotropic effect of such a high dose. If this is a new diagnosis, I wait until they're euvolemic, and that's when I put the beta blocker on board. That's kind of a compilation of a lot of different trials. That's how most people do it. And then obviously, if they're cold in any way, we do not give them beta blockers. If they are in shock or close to it, because that's only going to worsen the shock. Okay, so that's beta blockers in a nutshell. Um, I put up a quick thing about tajoxin, but we're going to finish here. That's just to say I only use this for AFib in systolic heart failure. I don't use tajoxin for standard treatment of heart failure at all. Be very careful. It doesn't do any good for anybody. Next slide, please. Okay, so most of your patients will be warm and wet. Diuresis, don't forget afterglobe reduction. Careful with beta blockers and try to get them onto goal-directed therapy at the time of discharge, even though it's a lot of flipping medications. Okay, it's one o'clock. <laughs> we will not go into shock. We will try to talk about that another time.